Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. What up, what up, what up, podcast party, people. Remember I said, I hit the table, and then I said P really loud. Boom. Hit the table again. Boom. A little shake. A little shake on the table. What's happening? What's happening? Just interviewed John Petrucci. I'm, I'm a little behind now. I took last week off, if you remember, from podcasting because I was in the studio. So now I'm back to being behind. I had two podcasts scheduled for today. I got the halo effect coming on, but uh, they had to bail because I guess we got mixed up with the days they were available and just fucking didn't happen. So now I'm behind again. Actually, I'm not behind. I'm right on so if i do a podcast today which i just recorded it'll drop on thursday night friday morning which is fine but it just makes me anxious i need to have a backlog so i can keep going just want to let everybody know coming up we got holidays coming up we've got machine head in the studio coming up On Tuesday, which is the day that I normally record podcasts, I'm going to be recording drums on the new album with Naveen. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be probably a little sporadic throughout the holidays. Um, You know, I think uh, Christmas Day is like a, yeah, like Christmas Eve is a Friday and like, you know, Christmas, like I don't, I don't see it happening. I don't even want to release a fucking podcast on christmas eve you know like i don't think people are gonna listen i'd rather and then the next week is the same thing next friday is new year's eve i don't think motherfuckers are gonna listen to a podcast on new year's eve i mean maybe you will but i'm feeling like you know we may space it out then you know like just i don't want to work i don't want to do shit on those days you know, if I have enough podcasts to do it, I will. And I am trying to make the most of this time here. I do actually have quite a few guests lined up for December, which I'm stoked about. I've got uh, Andy from Black Veil Brides coming up. I've got uh, Spencer from Ice Nine Kills coming up. I've got the Halo Effect coming up. Uh, Peter and Mikhail. So, uh, or Stan, I, don't, I think his name's Mikhail. Somebody said it called him Stan today, so I was just like, I thought his name was Mikhail. Anyway, uh, got a bunch of those guests lined up, and then I've even got some guests lined up for January. I've got Ross Halfen, photographer extraordinaire. He has committed to the beginning, not January, but to the beginning of the year. And I was like, wow, cool. Ross did. Ross and I have done a couple of photo shoots most notably, we did the bloody uh, Gibson photo shoot for my signature model that I dropped years ago. But he, man, he's got stories galore. He's going to be good. So, uh, yeah. Got a bunch of shows coming through town here pretty soon. We're still, you know, the weather here is still pretty nice. So people, We're not seeing gigantic spikes in the Bay Area with COVID, so... Mastodon and Opeth are coming through. Exodus and Testament and Death Angel coming through on Saturday. Probably going to go check these motherfuckers out. I'm actually for sure going to the Testament Exodus one. And I probably I imagine I'll be here on Thursday working and then just go right to the Fox, which is right down the street from me. From my studio. So yeah, got some metal coming up to check out live. Um... Yeah, let's see. What else? You guys really liked that KK interview. Holy moly. So much. Tra- I mean, that shit got picked up everywhere. Lots of people were just like, oh, my God, such a great interview. It was a great interview. It was a awesome. He's an awesome guest. He's just so many stories, and it was 
it was cool to kind of, you know, do the deep. I love doing the deep dive with people, man. Like it's great to do the deep dive. You know, he was great for a deep dive because he's got so much life he's lived. You know, so I, it was fun. It was really, and I'm glad you guys enjoyed it too. And if you remember, one of the things I was talking about in the intro, I was talking about how I was listening to the Metallica podcast and Lars at one point was talking about how, you know, people fall in love with a record and he's, I think he's right. You know, like he, people fall in love with the record cause it's like they lost their virginity to master of puppets or whatever, you know, like whatever album it is. And, and then I started thinking back and I asked you guys, I started thinking about my first time and I don't, I, you know, honestly, I don't recall having a lot of sex to Metallica. I don't know why. <laughs> If I ever did put on music, I don't believe it was Metallica. I remember a lot of Alice in Chains with Ginevra when we first got together. And that was pretty hot. And then uh, not exactly, you know, kind of depressing music, but still it was just great because it's got the good groove. Um, but then I told you guys a story about me having sex to uh, Merciful Fate <laughs> in a graveyard. <laughs> And then I asked you guys to tell me your stories. And uh, you guys did get a I got one email. That's it. One email. But, you know, there was a bunch of comments on the YouTube. So I'll read the comment. First email is from Robert Mann. First and only. <laughs> First and only email is from Robert Mann. Life of Agony River Runs Red is what he lost his virginity to. Man, this was perhaps not the brightest, most positive album to bang to, but God, God damn did the experience leave an impression on me. That band has stuck with me for life. It will always remind me, however, River Runs Red, that no one should do anything, let alone having sex for the first time on while high on shitty weed, drunk on Zima and in the dark. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. I th I appreciate I appreciate the details too. Thank you, Robert Mann. Many other people didn't have a whole lot of details on theirs, but I appreciate the details. I expected something from Kevin Fishder, I Fishder or whatever. I would have thought that he would have had a a first. Uh, I would have thought that he had a first time, but I didn't hear anything. Nothing from. You know, he's got the great story about uh, how him and his wife go camping and they found some air mattress in a rainstorm and now that's their like late night loving air mattress <laughs> i guess they leave out the kids go to sleep they're just out there in the in the dark camping anyway we learned that about them on we learned that about this on no fucking regrets podcast that's right inferno satix says nine inch nails downward spiral album first time in a graveyard music was horror movie scores they did it in a great Inferno Satix Satix Sex. First time in a graveyard was with horror movie scores. That's pretty good. I was like, that's pretty good. I definitely didn't think, uh, you know, you could play like the Halloween theme. You could play the Freddy Krueger music. You know, Friday the Thirteenth. Uh, James. Kulanko, James Kulanko says Ted Nugent free for all and grain alcohol. <laughs> grain alcohol and Ted Nugent free for all. That's a long song too. Down, da, 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 down, do, 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 do. Cool hand Chris Rocks says. Oh, that's, he doesn't say anything about this. Uh, Carol Jess Joseph. Carol K A. R E L Joseph says first sex was with cannibal corpse eaten back to life playing behind can't beat it Carol I don't know if that's a guy's name or a girl's name or maybe it's maybe it's Joseph Carol I don't know yeah I don't know but it's for, but there for I'm not going to say he or her their first sex with cannibal corpse eaten back to life behind it wow that's pretty hardcore man that's pretty hardcore let me say Douglas M says, first time, Opeth, still life. Then, plenty of typo negative, especially world coming down. Yeah. I could see that. I could see typo negative. I've never, I can't say that I've ever had sex to typo negative or Opeth, but I could see both those baby. You know, they got these little atmospheric parts, you know, but then it'll go into like a groove. Kind of 
kind of the Sabbathy groove here and there. Yeah, I could I could see that be and Peter Steele's got sexy, sexy voice where he's talking like this. And he's always talking about his heart being broken. Yes. I could see that being good. The chicks would be the chick would be into it. You could be into it. You know? The chick could be like pretending in her mind she might be imagining imagining that you're Peter Steele with your big cock. <laughs> Peter Steele's big cock. You guys ever see the Peter Steele uh, Playgirl where he poses naked with his big cock? He had a pretty big cock, I gotta say. He had a fucking pretty big cock, old Pete Steele. And everybody's like, I was on Roadrunner at the time. Of course, you, I had to see it. Everybody's, any, if you were on Roadrunner Records, everybody saw that shit. We were just like, what? He posed in Playgirl. And then he used to joke about how it was the worst selling, worst selling Playgirl of all time. He was on the cover, actually. If you recall, he was on the cover of Playgirl, all, all oiled up. He had a nice body, though. You know, he had the chest, he had the shoulders, he was tall, he had the fucking ridiculously awesome, super long hair. He was a stud. He was funny. I love Peter. He was a good guy. He always, I've told this story a bunch of times, but he always used to say to me, he's like, Rob... I love a man who can accessorize because <laughs> I've always got, I've always got my bracelets and my necklaces and my, I love a man who can accessorize. <laughs> I guess that's what happens when you grow up with five sisters. You, know, you, you learn words like accessorize. So, uh, yeah, but he was cool. We had some good times. He, we played a lot together. We, we, we did Ozfest together. And then... We did a bunch of European festivals together, and then we did a lot of off dates. We did tons of off dates with them. So, like, a lot of times when you're doing a festival circuit in the U.S. or in Europe, you'll do the festival, and the festivals are, like, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you got to figure out some place to play. So you just go do a headline show or you co-headline with another band, and we always linked up with them. You know, like, it's like a lot of shows. Kick it with Johnny Kelly and Peter and yeah, funny motherfuckers, really funny. But there you go. Those are all the those are all the replies to the first sex question that was handed out on uh, during the KK Downing episode. And then I tell you what, as I was talking to John Petrucci today or as some people call him, the Trooch. He, uh, they found out that he got fucking nominated for a Grammy. He just got nominated for a Grammy today. He, they got nominated, and it was pretty good, too. It was like, I think it was more fair this time. Like, a lot of times in the metal section, they'll put, like, Green Day or Foo Fighters. I'm like, come on now. Like, you know who's going to win? Fucking Foo Fighters. Don't put them in there. They're not fucking metal. They're a great band, but they're not metal. Anyway, this year it was... What was it? I was just reading it. This year, the Grammy nominees, which you probably already know by the time that this airs, but I just saw it. What was it? I just saw it on Metal Sucks. Where is it? Where is it? No, where did I see it on Metal Sex? Oh, here we go. Yeah, there we go. It is Deftones, the song Genesis. This is for best metal track or something. I don't know. Dream Theater, The Alien, Gojira, Amazonia, Macedon, Pushing the Tides, Rob Zombie, The Triumph of the tri, The Triumph of King Freak, which, according to Metal Sex, and I probably agree with this, it'll most likely be Rob Zombie. He's the most well-known of all those people but if he does if rob zombie does win dream theater could win too they've been nominated a few times deftones are nominated in a few car- in a few categories they're actually nominated in the rock category as well um but dude if rob zombie wins that's going to be the first i believe that'll be the first grammy win for nuclear blast records in history Cor- i could be corrected i'm going to in fact, I'll text the head of uh, Nuclear Blast right now. I'll ask him right now. Have you ever been? 
Has Nuclear Blast ever won a Grammy? Question mark. Yeah, baby, Siri. I love that talk to text. God damn it. It's fucking awesome. So he'll get back to me when he gets back to me. But uh, if they do, that's my label, man. That'd be their first Grammy win. That'd be big shit. Be pretty fucking cool. Um, let's see. Well, he just got back. What Grammy did you win? Why did I? Why didn't I just talk to text that? I should have just talked to talked to talked to, to text. Boy, that's a tongue twister. Say that fast. Talk to text. Talk to text. Talk to text. Oh, here he goes. What Grammy did you win? Here we go. No, we haven't. Oh. You've been nominated, comma, but haven't won. Question mark. Yes. Yep. All right. Yeah, they've been nominated. They've been nominated a few times. But if they fucking go with zombie, dude, that'll be pretty big. That'll be pretty big. I'm talking about it on the podcast right now. Yeah, that'll be pretty big. And I think, dude, I think Nuclear Blast has got a chance to do this. I think they could do this. If they do, that'll be awesome. It'd be a big win. That'd be a big win. Anyway, check this out. I just got John Petrucci from Dream Theater. This is the song that got nominated. And it's kind of a banger. They've got three songs right now in their top five from the in fact almost their entire uh top 10 on spotify is from their new album but this is the song that they got nominated for This is the first time I've heard this. Oh, yeah, there you go. I guess this song is in 1718. I don't even know what that means. That's fucking heavy. Let's get to the vocals. I don't know which I don't know where they are. There we go. <laughs> Vocals are like three minutes in. This is a, this is their number two song on Spotify, Panic Attack. Looks like it is off of the album Octavi- Octavarium. Twenty five million streams. Yeah. 
number one song on Spotify, which kind of surprised me because this is a pretty old song, though it was a big hit for them, I remember. But this is from 1991, dude. Pull Me Under, number one song on Spotify still. Very cool. I remember this video. MTV played the shit out of this. To me, this was very, uh, it had like that total Queensryche vibe. Maybe more proggy, but like, I remember digging this song. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to bring you here right now. Great conversation with a really super nice dude. Super nice dude. Ladies and gentlemen, the mighty, mighty John Petrucci. John Petrucci. What's happening? How are you, man? <laughs> I'm good. Did I tell you I'm coming to you all the way from the mountains of Norway? I, I love it. I love, you know, the mountains don't look very snowy. Norway look quite summery right now. <laughs> yeah. I left my boots on the, uh, on the mountain. Oh, those are your boots right there, right? Right. And there's a little guy like standing on the edge. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> That's classic. Did you take this picture or is this just a, a background no. that you created? So this actually, I don't want to get blurry. Now I made myself blurry by doing that. Um, this is actually the album cover of the new Dream Theater album. Oh, sweet. And uh, it, Hugh Syme did the artwork and it, it's, you can't see it. If I move my head, I'm going to get blurry. But if you see the rec, the album cover, it's uh, these two big, massive kind of mountainous things on the left and right. And then this rock, this giant rock stuck in the middle, like suspended. And uh, I didn't know this, but apparently it's a real place in Norway. It's like a tourist attraction that people trek to. And some of them stand on the rock in the middle if they're daring. But Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And it's like uh the 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 rock is uh floating between the two big rocks, you mean? It is. Yeah. It is. It's right in the middle. Yeah. It's I couldn't crazy. see it. I didn't see it when you pulled away. So now but now I understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be pretty daring to stand on that. Yeah, I like, could pull away, but I'm going to get blurry. See? Yeah. yeah. There's a That's viewfinder on it. Yeah. That's rad. All right, now you got blurry me. Let's try it. All right. Hugh Syme <laughs> of Rush Yes. Negadeth fame. I mean, that dude's been doing album covers for a really long time. Absolutely. And, I, you know, decades and decades. And I love, uh, you know, because I'm such a huge Rush fan, uh, just the conversations that we have about art and stories and origin. And, you know, it's just, it's so cool. You know, one day he told me, he's like, oh, you know, the uh, permanent waves cover he's like that guy that's like in the corner he's like that's me <laughs> like, I'm like oh my god <laughs> i mean it, like it's that. pretty unusual for an artist to last that long in yeah. the album cover music business yes exactly <laughs> i mean i i'm trying to think you know maybe the slayer guy from rain and blood to you know i, I don't even know like i don't i don't think he did anything you know like it's pretty it's pretty wild. Like, yeah, there's only 79. A, you're talking about permanent waves of 79. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's 79 and never mind that. But, you know, when was their first album? You know, I yeah, whenever his what's, what's, what's it. Do you remember what his first album is that he does art for? No. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't want to get this wrong and Rush fans will kill me, but I assume he started with the very first one. Yeah, he's done every one, and you know since. Really, but, uh, you think he did the first ones? I don't. I, don't I, I assume, but again, I mean, I, I don't. You know, obviously, he did the Starman twenty one twelve and all that. But even before okay. that, yeah, okay. he did. He okay. did a Farewell to King. Yeah, you know, I just I what's the one with the naked guy in the butt? Yeah, that that's what I'm. That's the one. That's twenty one twelve with the no the, the Starman. Guy. No, 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 the other. Oh one. no, I'm sorry. Right. I'm sorry. You're talking about Hemispheres. Yes, Hemispheres. Yes. yes, that's actually one of my favorite albums of all time. Yeah, that's a great album. Yes. 
That's a great. That's a, I, that must have been such a, uh, uh, you know, for the time, such an edgy album cover. Oh, totally. Well. You know, to totally. A, a naked dude. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, done super artistically. Right. You know, like, a, it, you know, it's almost like one of those famous statues or something. Like, it's done right. so well. Yeah, but it's on a brain, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's smart. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, that's awesome. That's really cool that you guys continue to use him. And it's a, it's amazing that he, he continues to put out, you know, album art. I would imagine it's his, maybe his main career at this absolutely, point. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I know he does other artwork. He does galleries. He does, you know, he has a whole career, art career. But um, it, one of the things I love, I just love working with him because like, you know, I call him up. The first thing is like, are you interested in doing another album cover? He's always like, yeah. Absolutely. And then we just have these great conversations about art and music and lyrics, and it just gets so deep and intense. And, you know, in the case of this album, we were trying to think of a cover that would fit the title of View from the Top of the World, but not be so like blatant, you know, like some sort of like a mm-hmm. drone shot or something. And uh, so we, he came up with so much art and you know, the pieces, they were all beautiful. So even if, if they didn't end up being a cover, they ended up being like in the layout. Oh, cool. Um, because we end up always doing these extensive, like 40 page layouts that come with the deluxe set, you know, so none of that art is wasted. And it's just, it's just a great process. And I look forward to it just as much as I do, you know, making the music and producing and everything else. It's, it's so much fun. I, I love that you're, uh, that you still, get off on that you know like totally. putting out a, putting out a, a an awesome package for people yes. to buy even if we're in a you know majority streaming world yep. at this point but you know like the you, you know it, it there is something about putting a whole like when you see your concept come through and it's like it's a 24 page or a 40 like it, you're just like fuck like it, it <laughs> makes you feel proud right absolutely and it's it, you know for i mean at least i'm this way i know the other guys feel this way hugh is like this a lot of people uh, who are friends of ours are like this as well, but it's like, we sort of remember the, the, the process, you know, of getting some, a new record, an album, holding it in your hands, going to the store, opening it up, diving into all the art and finding little Easter eggs and things. Right. And like, that's not lost on us. So it's like the experience, we don't want that to go away, you know? So we just, we perpetuate it, whether or not it's the normal thing to do or, it kind of bucks the system, you know, it, it, to us, it's gratifying and it's fun. And you find that there are a lot of people that feel the same way out there. And it's, it blows my mind how huge vinyl is now and how much of a comeback it came. And, you know, it's, it's pretty crazy. So we stayed our course and it's like coming back. (laughs) Did was, uh, when you first, you know, I, I know you're talking about like before Dream Theater, though, like yes. the vinyl era. When Dream yeah. Theater came out, I mean, vinyl might have been dead at that point, wasn't it? Like, was it just CDs and cassettes at that point? You know what? It was like, CDs and cassettes. Um, there were records still. There was still vinyl. Okay. Um, CDs were definitely the preferred, you know, media at that point. Yeah. 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 Like, I don't Absolutely. remember. Like, I think I, you know, I, I was in a. I think we were on. I think we were on the same label at one point. My, I was yes. I used to be in Violence, and you were in Majesty, which was on totally. Mechanics, right? It was on Mechanic. That's hysterical. <laughs> that's awesome. Steve Sinclair. <laughs> Steve Sinclair. That's right. The whole yeah. gang. That, totally. Yeah. Yeah. But we didn't. We didn't put out a vinyl. Like we put out a CD. No, actually, gotcha. you know what? That, no, that's not right. That's not correct. We did put out a vinyl, and then we. The first time that I ever got a CD or saw a CD mm-hmm. was for the Violence record, and I was ah. like what the fuck is this supposed to play? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what's, what's this? What is this? I remember at the time too, they had the big long packaging, you know? Right. Right. And uh, so they had some art that was on there. So, you know, it wasn't the way it is now with the, you know, the, uh, digi packs and stuff was, uh, I don't, you, you know, I don't remember, but majesty was you and poor, it was essentially most of the guys from dream theater, right? It was. Yeah. So majesty was, that was like our first band. So, when John, my young, and I uh, graduated high school, we went to Berkeley College of Music. We met Mike there, and we formed our band. So the, it, we called it Majesty. So in the early days, the little demos and stuff that we did and passed around, they all said Majesty. They were, you know. Um, and then when we got signed, did your logo have hooks on the side of it? 
<laughs> you know, our logo was like everybody had to have like hooks. On exactly. Well, I, I, I designed the first majesty logo and it's, nice. it's pretty adolescent. I think I used a crown to top the, yeah, it's pretty cheesy <laughs> to, to top the J or something. But, um, we, we got signed to mechanic, uh, Steve Sinclair signed us as majesty. And then when we went to, uh, put out the first album, it was like, Oh, you can't use that name. Somebody trademarked it. Oh, gotcha. And we're like, okay. really? Oh man. And we, we like had the hardest time trying to come up with a new name. It was like impossible. We had the worst, stupidest names that we almost used. It was we'll give it, we'll give it, give us the worst, stupidest name that you all almost right. used. I don't know what we were thinking, but we had an attorney at the time and, and her last name was Glasser and we almost named the band Glasser. <laughs> <laughs> Just at randomly after our attorney's last name. <laughs> That's how desperate we were. You're like, your name's really, cool. you really <laughs> like your last name. It's awesome. We're going to name our band Plotnik. Right, right. But um, eventually. Portnoy Port didn't come up as a, as a, as a band name. <laughs> well, actually close. His dad did. His father came up with Dream Theater. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, oh you mean the name Portnoy didn't yeah, come yeah. up as a name? Yeah, yeah we, ru we ruled out our own names. <laughs> okay. Um, but only, uh, attorney, or only attorney last names. Only attorney last name. names. Yeah, exactly. We we couldn't, uh, you know, it'd be too much of a fight to see whose name was going to be the yeah, name of the band. To pull off the Van Halen. Exactly, yeah. I guess it Maybe helps when you got two guys. If there are two brothers, then that would help. Yeah. Yeah, but Mike's dad, he, he lived uh, in Northern California. And uh, there was a movie theater up there in Monterey called the Dream Theater. Oh, wow. He used to go to. Yeah, it's not there anymore. It closed down. Um, but he, he, uh, we were so desperate and struggling to find it. And one day he called Mike, he said, Oh, I think this would be a great name. And we heard it and we were like, that's an awesome name. Yes. Like no second guessing. And then that was the name of the band. So we redid the first mechanic records art with dream theater and it came out. Yeah. So you had already gotten that far though. Like you had oh, yeah. done album art and yes. recorded the music and oh, yeah. Yeah, in okay. fact, Mike, being the collector that he is, I'm sure has an album with Majesty instead of Dream Theater on like our first album oh, artwork. Wow. That'd I bet be he cool. has that. That'd be awesome to see. Yeah. yeah. I, I guarantee he has that if it exists. Yeah. yeah. Do uh and does that that's not the pull me under record though? No. So yeah. that was our first record. And then the second one was Images and Words, and that's when yes. Pull Me Under came out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So actually, our mechanic, right? I don't know how it was for you, but I mean, it came out and people seemed to like it in that, those circles and said we sounded like Rush. And that was about as far as it went. And then just nothing really happened. We never went on tour. You oh, know? really? Oh, wow. Yeah, we never toured. We never had any radio play or anything. And there were some you just, bands. You just played locally? Yeah. 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 If that, you know, it was like so limited what we did. And then we decided, all right, something's not working here. We're going to change our singer. And then we, for like a year and a half, we like searched for a singer and wrote the music that would be images but you know at, at mechanic at that time there were a lot of bands doing really well i mean you guys were doing great there was bang tango and uh bang tango right? and trickster and voivod and, you <laughs> know so we who were we it was a yeah. very eclectic uh it was you know yeah. batch of bands it was yeah yeah we did pretty good he put a lot of money into us you know like, awesome. it was like the second coming of led zeppelin if you yeah yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah opened yeah. a magazine That's great we're like, look, we're we're not that good. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just keep your expectations low. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> but it but it was fun. I mean, it was it was it was fun. I, I wanna say we met Mike around that time. Okay. At the label, or maybe all of you guys. I can't, you know, it's gotcha. a little hazy for me, but uh yeah. I don't if you remember, I was hoping you might remember, but if you do uh, I don't I, I couldn't tell I you. Wish did I did you go to yeah. the did you go to the mechanics office? Yes. Yeah. That was yeah, where yeah. was it? It was like in the village somewhere. Or something. Yeah. 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 I don't remember exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I, yeah, I think we, we ran into, we crossed paths at that point and, you know, kind of became fast friends after that. Nice. Yeah. It, it was weird back then because, you know, for us, it was our first, like we got signed, like, wow, we got signed. You know, this is like the big thing. And then we did a record and like nothing happened. I remember thinking after it, it was like, what was, what was, uh, what was going on back there in the world? Was it Desert Storm? Like in the, 80, I'm, th I'm talking 89, 80, yeah, 80, 80, 89, first, 90, yeah. 90, 90, like that. And everything was just so weird in the world. And we were afraid of getting drafted. And 
you know, oh, wow. nothing, right. nothing was happening with the label and we were auditioning singers and like kind of teaching and holding down day jobs and rehearsing every night in the basement of a, uh, like a pork store type of thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was, we, you know, it was weird. Right, at first it was, you, a, are you guys all at this point, where are you based? Long Island. Long okay. Island. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. yeah. So Everybody is the whole band. Yeah, we were at that time. Um, and then, you know, we eventually got James Labrie as our singer and he was a Canadian. So that that threw everything off. Now we weren't all local. <laughs> right, right. So you guys yeah. hadn't done, but you guys must have toured or not toured, but like, you know, gigged locally during we this did. time. We did like our gigging was so li like far and few between. We did like a few cool shows. Uh, again, I, I don't know why my memory is so foggy during that time like as far as what happened and when like i i remember like opening for like marillion and iron maiden and playing places like the ritz and stuff and you but open they, for iron maiden i i don't want to get this wrong i don't want to get this wrong but eventually dream theater did open for iron maiden and tour with iron i maiden. just meant back then though you but back then i feel like again i'll get lambasted for the wrong facts so some anybody could correct me please but i I don't know. I remember like a, a show at the Ritz or something. Okay. And us like playing opening, you know, and maybe, what, maybe I dreamt it. What? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that happened. <laughs> you start in a rumor that we opened for Iron Man. On our <laughs> right. first the album, hell's wrong with John. Iron yeah, man. But we didn't tour. We did, we did not tour. We had like just these one off kind of shows. Yeah. yeah. It was weird. It must have been good times though. Like that must have been absolutely you know, exciting. And it was. It was very exciting. Yeah, the we, beginning of it all. We thought that we were, we did a tour with Testament. They put us, I don't know if they put us on tour, but we got a tour with Testament. Yeah. On that first album. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Testament was fucking massive at the time. This is oh, yeah. a new order. I mean, it was just, they were the shit, like right. packing it everywhere. And right. somehow we got it into our heads that we were drawing all these people. Right, right. Because <laughs> yeah. we, we were drawing, like we're playing and the shows are great and like everybody's yeah. going crazy and we're just like, oh, fuck, we're killing it. Yeah. And then the next story went on was with Voivod and yeah, it, like it, the world just came to a screeching right. halt. You know, like yeah. now we're playing to like 150, 200 people that yeah. don't care at all. And we we're like, whoa, I guess we're not drawing right. people. What happened? <laughs> We lost our appeal. But you know, those first van tours, you know, they're, I know it well. They're, they, they fucking, you know, they put hair on your nuts and hair. Oh, your absolutely, nuts. man. Our first, so our first tour, our first van tour wasn't until Images and Words came out. So that was, so the first album was 89. And so Images was 92. So a few years passed. We got a singer. We got signed to a new label. And then, yeah, we went on tour. Did you guys get dropped from Mechanics, or did you? Guys... No, we requested to leave. Okay, <laughs> we had well, to nothing leave. Happened, yeah. right? Not, like... No, it wasn't anything too dramatic. Yeah, right on. Um, but who then, you, yeah, who we signed with who? Do you, who's the next label? So now, so then we got signed to Atco Records. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. so it yeah. was interesting. Yeah, Pantera so that, label. Right, exactly, exactly. The Pantera label. That whole scene. In fact, I remember it well when Pantera just blew up and they like were number one selling a million records in the first day, something stupid. Um, yeah, it was like a major, but it had like sick of it all and it had yes. Pantera and it had, yeah. Yeah. So we, so, and, and what we did being an inexperienced young band is we did what you should never do. And we signed an eight album deal. Holy uh, moly. Oh yeah. Wow. And, and the funny thing about it, it was, first of all, the person who signed us, his name is Derek Oliver. He was a journalist for Kerrang. He loved the band. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and then he that. was, he ended up being A&R, head of A&R at, at ATCO. And the president of ATCO was Derek Shulman, who me being ignorant at the time, didn't realize was the singer to Gentle Giant, one of the biggest prog bands from the UK. And oh, I, wow. I, I didn't know really who they were because I was just like a Long Island kid, like Rush, you know, <laughs> Rush Maiden. Um, anyway, so they thought we were fit. They signed us. We signed an eight album deal and they renewed the option for every single album of yeah. the entire deal. They never dropped us. The label changed names and A&R guys and presidents just constantly. It was right. like at go like a major, then it was yeah. at go East West. Then it was East West America. Then it was Electra. 
And then it was, you know, but it was all under the Warner thing. Yeah. And they, they literally renewed every option. We did every, all eight albums on that deal. That is incredible. Is that I mean, insane? That's, that's <laughs> dude. I mean, for anybody listening, who's not in the music business, that doesn't happen. It does not happen. <laughs> it does not happen at all. Yeah, it doesn't. And, and I don't, I don't, I'm not saying it's a good thing. So if you're young and signing a deal, don't sign an eight album deal. It's not really smart. <laughs> Derek Shulman was my uh, label president for a year or oh. a, year, a year and a half or something. Okay. Something. Yeah. He was, uh, he worked at Roadrunner for, I want to say I for the, in 1999. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. Yeah. And Roadrunner was the label that we went to when we finally finished out that Warner deal. Right. We right. To, yeah. That's right. Yeah, you put out like you put out a couple albums through them, right? We did. We put yeah. out a whole bunch of albums. It was great. The funny thing about that, I remember getting signed to to Roadrunner. Was Monty and, your guy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Monty, cool. I love Monty. And uh, they signed us, and and at the time, who was Roadrunner distributed by? It wasn't Warner at the time. It was like another. Oh, it was. Uh, they were with Island Def Jam for a minute. They were with. Uh, uh, was it like Universal or something? It might have been like Universal. Yeah. And we, so we finished our, our deal with, you know, the eight album deal and the whole Warner Atlantic group and everything. And we're like, oh, finally, you know, we're done with that. And we're going to be, in, you know, with a whole new label, all different people and everything. And I think like a week after we signed, they announced that Warner bought. <laughs> Road Road Road. Road. <laughs> it's like all the same people. Again. It was like totally like the Al Pacino, you know, just when you thought you were. <laughs> Although at that point, that was kind of that golden era of Roadrunner where it was still an autonomous label, had its yeah. own, you know, own offices yeah, yeah, worldwide, yeah. you know, had a staff of 140 people. Like, so yes, it, it, it really was like its own fucking label. It was. It was phenomenal. I loved it. I loved Monty. I loved the whole experience there. Everybody that we worked with on all the records were awesome. Yeah. Loved a would Amy have label. been your publicist? Amy Schiaretto? Um, that does sound familiar. Yes, I think so. Right on. Yeah. But they were all great. Um, and then when Monty left, Dave Rath took over and, um, yeah, we just, we had a great time on that label. It's awesome. You guys are with, uh, I, uh, you guys are distributed or partners with Sony, somebody else. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, so know. after the, the roadrunner, actually we re-signed with them. We had uh, signed a couple of, you know, deals there were like a couple of albums each and then we we decided to make a change we signed with inside out um who is uh distributed distributed by sony and the story with inside out is that it's it's basically like the biggest sort of prog music label like that's like their whole identity and the the president of it the head of it his name is thomas waver and he was a fan he's a german guy was a fan from the beginning came to like the first dream theater shows and we knew him forever we oh, knew wow. this guy forever and he just like as our career was moving along his career was moving along and he'd have different labels and things and eventually he got it to the point where it was this great label and in a, in a great home and he you know pitched it to us hey i think it's time and so in some ways it was kind of like coming home because it was like one of the original guys who was there from the beginning, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's we signed cool. with them. Yeah. And so that's been great. Thomas has been great. Um, we just got some great news today. We just got nominated for a Grammy, which is nice. Damn. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank dude. you. Thank that you. is fucking amazing. Yeah. yeah I so, saw that those were coming out today, but I didn't get a chance to look if who got that. That's fucking awesome, dude. Yeah, it's fun. I we we had on Roadrunner, we we got two nominations, which was which was a lot of fun and it's so exciting, especially because you know, a prog band from Long Island playing 20 minute songs, who we're never gonna be in that world, you know. Right. So getting kind of into that was was really cool. And then uh yeah, we haven't had one for a while and it's interesting, like the the metal and rock scene. As Your far record as just Grammys. dropped, right? Yeah, it came out in October. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, well, this this was for the the first single that we did. It's called "The Alien." Okay, and it's in the best metal performance, and it was fun because, uh, you know, of, of all days, like I, I don't get my hopes up, but it, but I, it's also interesting and fun to watch. So they were doing the live stream of announcing the nominees, and okay, and I was like, ah, eh, you know, did I'm you not know? Get my, no. So okay. I, you know, so I went out and like ran some errands. <laughs> I was like at the bank and my manager's like, congratulations. I'm like, what? 
you know so he's like billy eilish just announced that you've got the grammy nominee. billy eilish she, yeah, she was the one doing the announcement i'm like of all times i miss watching it live you know right but it's anyway. got to be up there on the internet somewhere yes i, I did the we'll pull it. that we'll put the we'll put the link in here right there now. you go you so that make a note of that yeah so that was the fun news of the day and it's it's, it's really cool yeah badass yeah. man yeah is it a 20 minute song it's not a 20 minute song but it's not a short song either yeah um it's called the alien it opens up the album we we uh it, and it's it, here's the funny thing and the ironic thing about this whole thing it's in like 17 8 time it's really bizarre right you know but somehow it broke through um and and the, this record that we did that we started a, a year ago more than a year ago we did as a result of just being home and not on tour because of the pandemic and being like what do you guys want to do <laughs> you know like we weren't supposed to be making a record normally we would have still been on tour right right and so we didn't really know what kind of album we were going to make and the direction we had some talks but we're like let's just get together in october you know let's see what happens we'll have fun we got a new espresso machine <laughs> we have we built <laughs> we built our own uh our own dream theater headquarters a couple of years ago and badass yeah badass. so i i had recorded my solo album there actually mike portnoy played on that um and called terminal velocity and yeah, then we no, did, i was just uh yeah. I was just checking i just watching a interview you guys talking about that i didn't want to go into because i feel like it's just been over talked about it this that's point, all right so. I'll, I'll talk about anything but we we did sorry bumped into my thing here um but then we did liquid tension experiment over this the summer with mike and jordan and tony uh levin mm -hmm. and then we're sitting there like okay we know we could record albums here it's a new place but it all sounds great let's do a drink theater album there and I guess the point of my story is the alien was the first thing we wrote when we got together and just had too many espressos. And we we're like, what do you guys want to do? <laughs> like, I don't know. Let's just see what happens. So it's kind of fun com coming full circle now to get that nomination. It's sort of a nice nod, you know, that sometimes that works, you know. So do you guys, when, when you're getting together, is this the first time that you're putting together music or have you emailed ideas to each other? Right. And normally we would uh, pro probably have prepared a bit more if, if it was a normal cycle and we knew we were going in, you know, we'll text ideas a little mm -hmm. there, there's in their most basic form. It's like on your phone is a voice memo or it's just right. like a quick video, whatever. Right. Right. Um, and some things will fly back and forth, but this time again, we weren't really supposed to go into the studio. So none of that really happened. Yeah. Um, and, and even if, you know, in a normal situation, if if ideas weren't flying back and forth in that way, we'll at least we'll have like collected ideas. So then we have a list to go through. But we didn't even have that. We were like, yeah, let's just like not put any expectations, see what happens. And, you know, we didn't even know when the album was going to come out, how long it would take and all right. that stuff. So it was kind of it was cool in a way. It was this different. sounds like it was almost at the beginning of the pandemic. It was uh, October of the pandemic. Okay, gotcha. 20. So yeah. Six months into it. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yep. things finally started opening up and people could see each other again and yeah in fact our singer james again uh being that he's canadian and still lives there he actually couldn't come down uh -huh. um because he couldn't travel to us so he we we were all together in the you know our space and he was beamed in via zoom like we're doing right now which worked out for him he was in his home studio and he can kind of look at us and listen and we could talk to him and Oh, okay. You know, it, it like was he would watch the rehearsals. He'd watch us right. And yeah. you know, he'd have he'd be tapped into his sound system. He can hear what we're doing. Okay. He could talk to us. We can talk to him. And it, it's funny because he said it actually was kind of worked out better in a way than when he's physically there in person. Because if you could imagine, you know, the four of us kind of just cranking in a room with ideas going like a million miles an hour. And then he's a singer sitting there with his mic, like, hey, guy, <laughs> like, you know, yeah, he's kind I of this idea. For you guys to flesh out. What right, you exactly. Out. Yeah. And then, and then, and then if, a, if an idea pops into his head, he has to kind of run out of the room because it's too noisy and like record something. So he was saying at home, you know, it was almost better. Like he hadn't had a workspace and right. if he had an idea, he can get it down. So it would work that fine. And then, march of this year but when uh, he stay when yeah. he comes down normally though is he staying at somebody's house or is he in a hotel like hotel 
Yeah. Hotel. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. even even more so, like he's, you know, he's away from you guys are all going home at night after you rehearse. Yes. He's going yes. back to a hotel. So like that's true. Probably, probably was a lot better in other some other ways. It was more comfy for him for sure. Yeah, he got to eat dinner every night with his family. Right. <laughs> right. Um, the last uh, the album before this, uh, we did something cool that was different, where we all went away together. We did like a retreat kind of thing. Um, which we've actually never done before. And we went to the, uh, into the Catskill Mountains, upstate New York, and rented this beautiful barn and just stayed at the house on the barn. And, you know, that was our little world. And it was during the summer. We barbecued, hung out, you know, and made, made a record. It was a lot of fun. So that was a situation where nobody went home at night and we all just sort right. of did our, our how, male how bonding did that, thing. Did that work good? It did. It worked yeah. out really well. Yeah, it was great. I mean, we wrote the album really quickly, like in less than three weeks. Wow. Um, yeah. And then Holy we ended shit. up staying up there and recording it. It worked out great, actually. Yeah. It's really oh, cool. that's, inc that's incredible. Yeah. It takes yeah. me way longer to write a record. Than three weeks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it could. It Like, you know, with my solo album, when it was just me, you know, I'm just in the studio and my engineer sitting next to me and I'm like, I think this is a cool idea. <laughs> like, it'll, right. Okay, let me record it and then we'll take it here and there. And it's just all being bounced off of myself. Right, right. Um, so it takes a little more time, you know, but with the band. I mean, same with like liquid tension writing. It's just very fast. It's like just everybody just has so many ideas. I, I think Dream Theater, you know, we cultivated a bit more than like a project. Like liquid tension is more of like a, it's meant to be fast and like get the music written and out. A lot of improv dream theater is we take more time but even have even having said that you know the writing part happens relatively fast but the project as a whole you know from beginning to end i mean it does take a while probably takes five months six months something like right. that Does that sound fairly normal it, it you know what my last six records have taken me about a year gotcha. <laughs> from start yeah. to finish, you know, yeah, yeah. and, and, you know, bouncing off ideas with the band and, you know, just whatever. Right. I don't know. That just seems to be like the number. Gotcha. And if it's less than that, it tends to suck a little more. <laughs> Got, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and if it goes to about a year, it seems like well, that's what everybody likes. So. Right. <laughs> it works. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I think uh -huh. I, I fuck, I fuck around a lot with arrangements and I change yeah. my vocals a lot just because to me, the vocals are, you know, big, big sure part of this you know like i'm a pretty limited singer so like i got when i do things i've got to have it be interesting within you know right. an area of about this far gotcha gotcha because i'm baritone and you know mostly yeah. uh, you know roaring and stuff so yeah yeah but, yeah, some, yeah but with some singing so it's like i gotta strike this balance yeah and you want it to be great and you want to you know make sure you put the time into it make sure it's as creative as it could be to so i'm sure you're like this you know, the same way that I am, where when you listen back to it, it thrills you like you're into it. Like, yeah, you know what I mean? You're not second guessing anymore. You're like, this is the shit. Yeah. Like, I can't wait for people to hear this. And that's the best place to be at. But I mean, sometimes it takes more craft work. It just does, you know, yeah, it just for sure. does. And it's worth it's worth the time putting into it, I think. Sure. You know, I, re I read uh, as I was researching you uh, and, you know, kind of just going through most of your interviews for the last i don't know year or whatever um you know in some ways i i kind of know a lot about you and in other ways i don't know anything about you <laughs> gotcha <laughs> you know like understood <laughs> there was there's i know everything about your gear that i could ever possibly want to know for yes. as long as i live <laughs> like, yeah there's ton, tons of gear so much gear information yeah yes. which mm -hmm. is great for gear nerds i'm yes i'm not a gear nerd though like i'm just like I kind of got my my gear and I like it, and then you know new stuff. I'm I I'm cool that people that there's new stuff out there, but I don't right. really care that much. Um, but I did. I the thing that was interesting to me was how much you're into weightlifting. Yeah, you know, I thought that was really you know an interesting thing that you do talk a lot about. Yeah, and uh, I wanted to kind of get into a little bit more. You know, John Petrucci, not guitarist. But sure. like human being. Yes. And, gotcha. Uh, rock, rock and roll <laughs> guitar player. You know? Right, 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 right. So, uh, you know, I just, I, I'm, I'm crazy about weightlifting. I, nice. I, like I'm super into it. Not that you'd ever know by my body, but like, I really <laughs> love it and I do it. You know, I've always been pretty physically fit. Like, yeah. 
even when I was raging and partying and going like a maniac, I still worked out to some degree every day. Yeah, something that that you connected with and you, you know, you felt like I'm sure if, if you get the same feeling, it's like you feel like you have to do it. Like yeah. there's a calling to do it. Like you feel weird if you don't. Totally. Yeah. Totally. I get it. Yeah. But you but then I got into weightlifting about two and a half years ago. Yeah. And um, you know, I just I thought it was great. I mean, I was did you have like did you work out today? I did work out. No, uh, I did not work out today. Did not I worked work out yesterday. Out today. Okay. I want to tell you why. This is my excuse. <laughs> You're doing press. I I, I I did worked out yesterday before I worked out my shoulders. I don't know if this is a good idea. I worked out my shoulders before I got my COVID booster shot. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, now you're like, holy fuck, my so, fucking shoulders are sore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my shoulder. I didn't work out today because I'm just giving myself a break from that. <laughs> how, are you, how are you feeling? Are you like? I feel fine. Okay. Feel fine. Yeah, yeah, my, my, my bassist got his booster yesterday and he was starting yeah. to feel sick at the end of our Yeah, run. yeah. It, it definitely can hit you that way. I feel okay, though. Yeah. So what was yesterday was upper. So yesterday was shoulders exclusively. Yeah. That's oh, okay. Uh, for some what's reason, your, what's your, tell me your routine. Like what's your, split? what's your, yeah. Yeah. I, I've experimented with a whole bunch of different things. Um, normally I, I kind of extend it out where I'll do just a, a, a basic body part per day. Okay. You know, so it'll be chest day. And then maybe at the end, I'll do just a set of tries just because I'm in that zone, but it's mm -hmm. not a chest and tries. Um, and then the next day we'll be back. But chest is like, you're doing bench press. You're maybe doing flies, yep. maybe doing dumbbells. Like, is yeah, there's yeah. various exercises. Exactly. Okay. Um, so there'd be like three or four different exercises that all each have like four sets or so. Okay. Um, and I'll do that with chest one day, back one day, shoulders. So they get their own day. Um, I'll do arms in one day. So tries and visors one day and then legs another day. Yeah. Um, do you have, have a trainer? A, I don't have a trainer. No, no. And you're, is this at home you're working out? Or yeah, gym? exactly. Oh. So I, so we have a, a home gym here. That's great. I have a Smith machine and plenty of weights and stuff. And it's, if I didn't have that, I'd be lost. Um, but uh, I do also belong to to LA Fitness, so I can go there. I haven't been since the pandemic, but right. sometimes it's good just to get out of the house and go to the gym and try, you know, just push yourself differently. And you know, there's different equipment there and stuff like that. But I haven't actually in the last you know year and a half. Um, but I I did some. You'll laugh at me. I did something so bad the other day. Uh, I had first as I get older. I learned that there are certain things that I shouldn't do as far as weightlifting because I'll like injure something, you know, like, <laughs> oh you know, God. like for Little. example, we were one time I was on tour and I do work out on the road, use the hotel gyms or go find gyms, whatever. They're not good enough. And I, we were in Mexico city and I was doing uh, bent over. Um, what, what do you call it? They're like, uh, it, it's a back exercise, but it's like, like rows. Yeah. Yeah. Like or, or maybe, rows. yeah. Or what's the one when uh, I it sounds so um, uninformed right now, because I haven't done it in so long where you'll, you'll start from the ground and then. Oh, stand deadlifts. Up. Yeah, deadlifts. Yeah. 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 So I was doing a, like both of those things and I, I tweaked my back so bad. Deadlifts, like I, man. <laughs> dude, I, I, and we had a show the next day and, that morning I woke up and I couldn't move. And I, and I remember taking a shower and like being stuck. Like I could not move. I, if I moved this a, a millimeter, my back would just, you know, I'd be like in the worst pain. And so somehow that day I was able to get massages and muscle relaxers and did the show on muscle relaxers, probably the worst, one of the worst shows I ever played. Um, but it taught me a lesson. Like there's certain things I, probably shouldn't do especially on tour yeah you know and there are a lot of those things where your body is compromised where you you have a lot of weight that's going on but you're using your lower back your lower back or your wrists in a way that they're yeah. really in a compromised position so because of that um i i kind of stopped doing certain things and i was having some some sort of hip issues from doing legs and stuff so i sort of like laid off of them a bit 
Mm-hmm. And the other day I found myself like, all right, this is ridiculous. I, got, I can't be the guy who skips legs, you know, you know, and I just, and I just, it's like the like, Lego movie and he never misses <laughs> leg. Day. Oh, totally. Totally. <laughs> like, I'm not going to be that guy. So, but it was so long since I did anything. Cause I'm like, so paranoid I'm going to tweak something. And I did a day of just body weight leg exercises. Mm-hmm. So you can imagine just squats or lunges, whatever, yeah, without any know. weight. I couldn't move. I, I was like, I was destroyed. And, and I, I was both like laughing and crying. Like, I'm, am I like this wimpy that I can't lift my own body weight with my legs? It's dude. It's a lot though. Like was, your own body weight. Is like, <laughs> my buddy, my buddy was just like, Hey, do some, uh, you should, you should, have you ever done the uh, Bulgarian leg squats? And I was like, I don't know what that is. He's just like, Oh, it's where you put the one foot on the weight bench and then your other foot goes forward yes. and then you go down. I did five of those. Right. <laughs> one you time each. I'm like, okay, I'm good. Like Totally. You can't get through like five. <laughs> that was me. That was me like two weeks ago. And I was telling my wife, Raina, I was like, I, cu- I couldn't walk for like a week. I'm like trying to walk upstairs. Like, what is wrong with me? Thankfully, um, I continued the process and now I'm yeah. fine and I can do legs again. But do you find, you know, though, like when you go back into it, are you going, yeah. like, I'm going to go back super hard on my first day back? No, I'm going easy. OK, no, yeah. I don't do that because that because that's exactly when you get hurt, you yeah. know, it's because, you know, especially with the, the compound movements all those other muscles need to support what you're doing. And those, you you know, that's what you'll injure. You know, it might not necessarily be your chest, but it might be like your forearms or your shoulder or something because they're not used to it. They're not supporting use of supporting weight. So I do not do that. I go in easy and, and build it up. And then, you know, when I feel strong, then I start pushing, but I guess, you know, the point is to listen to your body and as guitar players, like, you know, not just stay away from stuff where you could potentially injure your wrists or your hands or, right. You know, yeah, I do. Like uh, I just, it's funny. You mentioned the deadlift thing. I just yeah. was doing some deadlifts the other day and I took my back and I was oh, like, oh, dude. I was <laughs> yeah. like, God. Yeah. I, was trying to, I was teaching my son. He wanted to work out with me and I was like, nice doing it with him. And then I felt like a little pop them all. Ooh, that wasn't good. And then the next couple of days, I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah. I didn't say anything to him. I'm like, I'm not going to say anything to him, but I do find that after all of these years, and maybe you have this as well, but like after all these years of playing, I've got like weak points from, I feel like from standing with a guitar, like I find that my right shoulder, you know, is kind of pushed forward already just from like picking or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of hold it. I feel like my left glute, a left side even is like a lot weaker than my right side on my legs just from your stance probably yeah, from like the stance yeah. you know yeah like kind of that's constantly. so funny you know you're kind of like people don't think about this but when you play guitar you're kind of pushing your butt forward Absolutely. to like get your pelvis up and like yes. it's not a, it's not the right position for you to be in but no exactly play guitar yeah if you were in that position and then you threw a lot of weight on you you'd probably really get hurt yeah you know, it's not I, to take it down to a, a, like a, a smaller level. Um, I'm, my left hand fingers are more in shape than my right hand. Fingers. Right. Yeah. So they're like, they actually like have, you know, they're skinnier and have like actual form. Yeah. <laughs> I like, find that when I do, um, I was doing a, like I was up on two bars. Yeah. Like two parallel bars. And then I was doing like leg lifts or whatever. Gotcha. But it kind of puts your wrist in this weird. Like, it does. I know exactly what you're talking fucking, about. Like it just started getting numb here after yeah. a while, and I was like, yeah. "Okay, like this ain't gonna work out." You gotta watch stuff like that. I've I've, I've learned to be way more like to listen to that stuff way more because it's. I, I'll I'll never forget one one of these things I did. I was doing um, tries one day, and uh, I have these great like bodybuilding books and things. And of course, online there's all video tutorials. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna try this, and it was not anything unusual, but it was close grip bench presses, yeah, which targets your, your triceps more. And I was doing it. And, you know, if you think about it, like if your arms are out here, your wrists are straight. And as you bring them in on a straight bar, your yeah, wrists like- actually get turned out like this. Yeah. So I'm doing this with weight on my wrists. And all of a sudden it was like, like, I was like, shit. And I, I felt you know, I don't know if I had like a micro break or anything, but I just stopped. I will never do that exercise again. 
this yeah. was a while back. So, you know, I really have learned to watch which things to stay away from big time. Yeah. You got to keep the, the bread and butter going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> more, so, more so than, you know, you yeah. don't run or, Do you run or anything? Do you do a lift? No, or I, I, you know what? I, for cardio. some reason, I'm the worst with cardio and I really should do it. And I tend to do it, I think, more when I am traveling. Like if I'm at a gym, like because they have different things you could do. I feel like I'm get I get too bored at home. Like we have a stair stepper and, you know, I, right. I, I don't really like running. You know, so we'll go for walks and stuff. But uh, right. yeah, cardio is something I need to do more of. But, um, you know, I, I think it, the other feeling of the, the, about working out and doing weight training and or cardio, whatever, is it's, it's a funny like mental game with me, because if I have time to put aside to exercise during the day, I feel like I want to push weight around. Or I could do like the cardio thing. I know that's probably a stupid way of looking at it because you could still do like 20 minutes of cardio or 30 in the beginning and then still work out. But I'm like, if I'm going to spend an hour, like I want to just <laughs> train weights <laughs> and either sit there or stepping. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's, it's dumb to really look at it that way, but sometimes yeah. I do. I, I always do a do I live in a kind of a, kind of a rural area. Like I've got yeah. some fire trails out by me that have some pretty good hikes Nice. And so I always try and get like a 20, 30 minute hike before my workout with my gotcha. dog. And I got two dogs. I got to walk them anyway. So I'm like, gotcha. I'll just, I'll That's do That's great. That. And it does. I feel like it, I don't know. I'm, I'm stronger when I do it. Like I, I, I see that it's definitely better. I, I do because you, you're getting, you're breathing, you're getting your heart rate up, you're getting the blood flowing, you're getting oxygen through your lungs. You know, you're not just waking up like putting weight on you and pushing. You know, it's like you're kind of like getting your body ready. So I, I totally see that. I know the benefit. It's just, you know, again, you know, for me, um, I, I tend to skip that a little bit too much. So probably not good. <laughs> are you are you sober? Are you like yeah. you? Yeah. So no drinking. Oh, you mean like fully, fully sober? Yeah. I thought you meant am I sober right now? No, I'm only. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, no, I'm I'm not. No, I. I do enjoy alcohol, but I'm not, I never had any issues or problems with it. I, I thought that's what you meant. Yeah. No, like you yeah, no. drink wine with your wife or drink wine, you know, a couple I, of cocktails, maybe. Exactly. I yeah. drink bourbon. I got into bourbon uh, uh, a few years ago. In fact, it's so much so that I actually released a signature bourbon. Oh, kick ass. With, yeah. With the distillery called Iron Smoke up in Fairport, New York which is just outside of Rochester. They have this amazing distillery, incredible facility, incredible people. The, the guy who runs it is a guitar player, musician himself. Wow. And Tommy mm -hmm. Burnett, he was in uh, Modern English. And, you know, we just, just hit it off. And they do this process where they smoke, they cold smoke the wheat before it goes into the, uh, you know, into the process. And so it's called Iron Smoke. But we released this, uh, a signature one. It was a limited uh, run probably yielded you know 360 something or so ba uh, bottles it was called rock the barrel and uh we released that and it was like a yeah. john petrucci yes bourbon yeah. wow cool yes exactly so it's iron smoke john petrucci bourbon called rock the barrel and uh it's 120 proof so it's not Ooh. the faint of heart holy moly so I guess I should go back to your first question. Am I sober? No, I would say. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I misread that question. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't mean, are you sober when you're working? I would assume you're sober when you're working out. <laughs> do not mix the two. You know what? I don't mix at all. I don't know if you're like this because a lot of people aren't like this, but I don't drink at all when I play. Like when I practice, when I perform, I can't do it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I know for a lot of people that's not an issue and like some drinks kind of mellow, you know, kind of put people in the zone, but I, I have this, it's sort of this athlete thing with playing guitar where I feel like I don't want anything to like, I don't know, be a detriment to what I'm trying to do, you know? Right. And I feel like any sort of drug or alcohol is going to do that and I'm not going to be able to play when I'm trying to play. So I never drink not only when I play on stage, but when I'm in the studio or even when I'm just home playing guitar and practicing, I won't, you know, I, I, I feel like I, I would just have the worst time <laughs> if I did that. 
So yeah. that's like my own my own rule. But I've gone I've gone back and forth many times in my yeah. life with that. <laughs> okay. For the first few years I toured, I was sober as a judge. You know, gotcha. like I wouldn't even drink after the show. Right. I was freaking out. I was paranoid about losing my voice. Yeah, with, I uh, could see that. You know, as as a singer, yeah. Yeah. You know, our and singer then, doesn't drink at all on, and, on tour. And then I went on tour with uh with Pantera and <laughs> Oh, forget about it. He's <laughs> done. Like, that was that was it. Like <laughs> from that point on, it was just I'm drinking all the I, so then I'm drinking between seven and ten shots of vodka oh my prior God. to the show. How do you and then right. another three or four on stage during the show and then after the show if i had a show the next day i would stop like i wouldn't drink anything like even right. party with people but if i had a day off then i would probably have another 28 to 30 shots oh my god yeah. that yeah. is a lot of alcohol it was a lot it was a lot holy shit and probably like three or four beers that and is then, a lot uh, and then one day i actually met and then you know a decade goes by and I'm like, holy, and I, then I managed to do it. You know, I'm, I sleep terrible and I'm, you know, whatever, but I just kind of chalk that up to being on the road. Cause I, feel yeah, like sure. I, sleep, I sleep shitty on the road, bouncing down the road anyway. Right. And then I measure, I actually measure like before then I would just eye it in a solo cup. Yeah. And I'm just pour the vodka. In the solo, and then I like, I, yeah. I had a shot glass in the dressing, right. which it almost never happens. Like an actual real shot. Glass. Actual. Right. Exactly. So I was like, I wonder, I wonder what, how many shots are in my, pre-gig drink and yeah. as i measured it and it was seven shots and it was like God, wow it blew, it blew my mind in my mind i was having maybe a shot or two and i was like holy fuck i'm having like you know if i'm doing a show and the show's a headliner show i'm doing maybe 11 12 shots that prior is a lot to of alcohol. And yeah and it's and it's vodka so let me ask you this so like you know if i had two shots you know i'd, I'd be buzzed like right in, in a second yeah so I'm, I'm, I'm when buzzed. you walk so when you walk on stage like what does it feel like do you feel do you feel like that you're not really there or do you feel like no it, i felt i felt totally felt like normal like, i i had so done bizarre. it for so long yeah that it felt weird going on stage sober to not do it i've heard people say that yeah like i I've and i was so that. and i could play Right. great you know like my voice you know might have had like some but you know other times it'd make my voice better because like if my throat was sore the alcohol right. kind of loosened it up more Interesting. but your playing didn't like you can actually play i could i had no problem playing it that and then, is crazy you know, at some point i got i got sober for a minute and i was just like yeah. okay i'm gonna quit and then i went on tour sober for the first time in, in a decade and yeah. i was like damn you weirded you out damn it i'm playing better <laughs> oh okay I'm like, gotcha. Fuck, i'm singing better shit right <laughs> well that's a that, that's the thing i was like it it would just have to be like because if you're yeah you know like i said a couple of shots you buzz like never mind you know seven ten twelve like you're drunk at that point like how could you actually play the you'd instrument be, you'd well be amazing. Your, your body does adapt though you know like right. it really you know you you know, I don't want to say I don't want to use the word like functional alcoholic, but like, it was like, <laughs> like, like I could do everything I needed to do. Functional I played, performer. I played all the time. You know, like we were yeah. playing all the time, so it's like, and I'd I'd still do you know a lengthy warm up. I'd still do a lengthy yeah. guitar warm up, vocal warm up, everything. So like, you right. know, this was just another part. It was like another warm up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, but now I do it. I do it. I do it. Uh, sober now, and I right. And I'm like, I know I this is better it's better over the long haul like i feel like i sleep better yeah sure uh, the, by week seven into the tour i'm stronger absolutely you know, that kind of stuff so Plus you that, feel like crap like you know let's let's face it if you're like on the road even if you're home and you're drinking a lot and then you wake up and you have you know a certain time you're supposed to go to the gym or whatever but you feel like crap yeah you're not gonna be you know then you're not working out and you're skipping and you know yeah i would still i would still be pretty good about it that you yeah, know, like, I don't know. Wow. It was it was almost like my punishment. Like, right, I exactly. This because this is what I did last night. <laughs> like, I wow. have to work out today because yeah, yeah, you fucked up last night. So, oh man. But uh, but you know, it's funny because I I did that for years. I was sober, mm -hmm. and now since the pandemic, I started doing this. Uh, it's like we call it electric happy hour. So it's mm -hmm. just it started off when nobody could come down to my studio. I yeah. couldn't rehearse. I was just like, okay, it's just me and an acoustic. I'm going to drink beer and play acoustic songs. You know? Gotcha. 
And I'm just like, fuck it. Like, if anybody, I started on Facebook Live, just on my iPhone, like, here, yeah, yeah. we're all stuck in. Like, right. if you want to tune in and drink with me, then go for it. Yeah. And uh, and I had never done that. And it was, it was, you know, the, the pressure was off. If I sucked, who cares? You know? Right, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and in another way, it was, for me, a, a really giant challenge. You know, like, right. me singing with an acoustic guitar is not you know anything i've ever done other than right. you know a handful of one off dates here and there yeah and uh you know it it really kind of it pushed me like it yeah, really pushed I'm sure. me like it really pushed me like okay i need like i'm not hitting these notes and i know what note i'm supposed to be going to and like right. i don't know why it sounds wrong but like i need to get better at this yeah, like, absolutely this, this is a weakness and I could get better because I know I can get better at this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, in some ways I think like drinking the beer kind of helped me get over the jitters of, of right. Performing in this very right. Exactly. Naked way. You're, you're, you pull back the curtain, you know, you're in, in that situation, you know, in those circumstances, you're, it is, it's true. It's when you really do realize what your strengths and re- weaknesses really are. And they kind of come into focus really quickly, Yeah, you know, um, and, but the, the cool thing about doing stuff like that is that when you put yourself in that situation and the more you do it, the, the sort of better you get at it. And it kind of like just helps you grow yeah. in a different way. Um, it's a similar thing, you know, I guess this, this is different, but like, I remember when I was younger and I was teaching a lot, um, it just, it, I kind of like, as I became a better player because I had to be more in like j- just knowledgeable and ready and I was playing every day and teaching every day and demonstrating and you know my my chops are up but also my musical knowledge and information that I was trying to teach everything was fresh and moving and it made me a better player and I, you know I've, I've heard other players say that when they put themselves they thrust themselves into you know possibly uncomfortable situations that aren't it's not necessarily your wheelhouse like it does if you stick it through, it does make you a better musician, better player yeah. for sure. No, I started taking vocal lessons yeah. and I've never, I had never really taken lessons, you know, and I short little period about 10 right. years ago, but I started re- really digging into that again and it did nice. help. It was killer. You know, like that's a, awesome. It was a wild thing. And then we do, we continued it. We've actually like expanded it now. So we still do it. I still drink beer and I drink two beers like while we're doing it. Yeah. But we mix up the set. We make no set list and we just call it off the top of our head. James Brown style. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, that sounds like fun. It is. It's like, That's cool. I, I was curious, do you guys like how set is the dream theater set when you're on tour? Like is gotcha. it immovable? Is there <laughs> jam spots in there? Well, it, it, kind of turned Im- immovable and it, i'll explain why it early on it was a little bit more flexible um and and we would kind of do things where we'd have multiple songs and sets and stuff like that and speaking of mike portnoy like that was something he was really into and like we just almost get bored really quickly so like let's not do that let's do this let's do this tonight and it, it we had more moving parts um but you know over the last I don't know, decade or so. Um, my whole thing was like, I really wanted to, to present shows the way some of my favorite bands did on the, on the level that they did. So an example would be Rush, you know, what would Rush do? And every time you saw them, it would just W-W-R-D. be this. WWRD. <laughs> yeah, exactly. WWRD. You know, it would just be this amazing show where everything would be coordinated. You know, when you walked into the venue, you were walking into their world you're walking into the surreal world that hugh sign created you know Mm -hmm. based on everything from the the merchandise and the tour program and the set design and the video and everything and then they pulled off these incredible shows where the light show and video show and everything was just so together yeah so and my whole thought was like there's no way you could do that if you're doing this like jazz style or Frank Zappa style, where you have learned 150 songs and he's calling out things or, you know, or like jam band style, like there's no way you're not going to put on that kind of show. Right. So I kind of focus more on trying to put on that kind of show, which in doing that makes, makes it more immovable because it's almost like you can imagine, I mean, it's a rock show, 
but it's almost like a more of like a stage like a broadway thing almost, where, yeah, like a, almost like a play yeah it happens the same every night on purpose because all that dramatic stuff that's going on when somebody's over there and all the lights shut off and there's a light only on him and then this thing happens and there's some weird lighting thing and right you know whatever you can't do that off the cuff like that has to be right. planned and rehearsed and everything and because of that you know the the payoff is you get one of the best shows that you've ever produced live and people watch it and hopefully if you do it right walk out of there being like oh my god that was so cool and the trade-off is that you don't have really the ability to change it up you know um you can have a couple of re revolving sets um but oh, there okay. aren't you know that that's a way around that mm -hmm. you know so maybe there's a set a b maybe a b c so they're slightly different but you don't have those opportunities where you could just go off and change everything up completely um, because then it throws off the entire thing that you, you worked on. So it's a bit of a trade-off, you know? Um, I don't know what people prefer, you know, or what excites people more, but to me, creatively, that's the kind of dream theater that I'd like to present. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the very best sort of live presentation that we can do. So it, it takes some discipline like I said, the trade-off is you don't get that ability to change things too much. We did, uh, Dream Theater and Machine Head did a, a grass pop festival, I don't know, a decade ago. Yeah, yeah. Maybe even longer. And you guys did Master of Puppets in its yeah. entirety. That's right. And I was just like, wow. Like, <laughs> if I heard the first song playing. I was like, oh, shit, Dream Theater is playing Battery? What? Fucking cool. And then you went, and then it kept on, and then it went into it kept Master, going. And then things, and I was like, holy <laughs> shit, they're doing the So I went up, and I was like, wow, this is fucking, that was pretty, uh, was that like something you were doing that whole tour, or was that just like a spontaneous thing for Grass Pop? It, it was, we, we had, uh, we had this thing that we were doing uh, again, I give him all the credits, another Mike Portnoy thing that he was really into, which w w it's probably get because he was getting bored of doing the same songs. Um, it's like, look, we're going to cover a whole album. And I thought, I think he said it at the time that was it like fish that was doing it on like New Year's Eve or something. They'd play a whole album again, oh, like somebody probably, else's album. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay, gotcha. somebody else. That some band was doing that. Again, I'm, all my facts are like mixed up. <laughs> um, so we started doing that, and we start. Yeah, we we covered full albums like Dark Side of the Moon, Wow, uh, Num Number of the Beast, uh, Made in Japan, and uh, we we decided to do Master of Puppets, and we did it. I, we didn't do it in many places. We did it in Barcelona, and I guess we chose to do it at Grass Pop, <laughs> yeah. which is it's kind of funny because it's like here we are playing a festival right. you know the whole point of festivals is so that new people get to see your music that wouldn't necessarily see right. so what do we do we play metallica songs <laughs> Still, in, i mean right. it, to, to your credit though like everybody went crazy because yeah you were playing master of Pop. right exactly yeah you know, like they're like Fuck, who cares what dream theater sound like this is right awesome. who cares? You know, maybe they checked you out because of that and so, right right exactly you know and at that point you know it, it especially that's in holland right grass pop uh belgium is. oh belgium oh, yeah okay so that part of the world i mean we've been there so many times so often right. so yeah. you know it's probably like a nice change up do uh what was do you recall the cha most challenging part of that yeah of that set yeah well ba batteries fucking freaking down -picking. hard that damn yeah. picking is fucking beastly totally beastly totally i had to like use a whole different you know sort of set of wrist muscles or something <laughs> to, be able to play that it's freaking fast you know yeah. batteries fast and damage is as well yeah right um right. but yeah a lot of down picking and just like a lot of those those quick like did it did it did it did it you know like it's just not it's not something that i do all the time mm -hmm. so i remember just i had to be really focused like more on that rhythm playing you know you yeah. really gain a lot of respect for what what uh james and kirk are doing there with that you know and like i said those songs are they're not easy you know no um they're fast batteries fast yeah even like master is like that whole thing yeah. is down picked <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> exactly i mean it doesn't sound too bad when you're just doing it for 10 seconds but right you realize the whole song seven minutes long <laughs> exactly the whole song seven minutes long and we did the whole album so it's yeah. like that's a stamina game right there you know yeah. so yeah i had to work up to that for sure
Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. It that was, was fun, fun though. You, you enjoyed those things though. Yeah. 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 It was fun. It's funny because it's both like nerve wracking and fun at the same time. <laughs> Cause it's like, Oh, we're fun. you know, the, you know how these things go. It's like, you have these plans, you want to you suggest things, but you end up not ever having enough time to actually rehearse it. Or it's like, you just always feel like you're almost winging it when you're doing it. Um, and, and so there was a, that feeling of like being unsure or a bit nervous, but also like excited because there's something in the air. And like you said at that show, it's like, wait, they're doing this. Wait, they're doing the next song. Like they're doing the whole album and you get this energy. So it's like these two feelings of being just like freaked out the whole time, but then also having a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, I suppose if we did that album every day for two months, all that stuff would go away. But being there, we're like, I mean, we might have done it twice or something. You know, they were not, we didn't do that a lot. I was watching some footage of you with uh, Joe Satriani and Steve Vai on nice. the G3 thing from, you know, when you were a short haired, clean shaven young That's man. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I mean, st I mean, we could probably just gush about how amazing both those guys are. But Steve Vai, though, to me is like just, another fucking planet of yeah. guitar playing like absolutely like, what the fuck <laughs> i know exactly i you know i first of all for me those two guys are first of all they're they're dear friends and i love them to death but just as the the fan kid of me like you know discovering them and i, I was freaked out by them you're you, both those guys steve and joe are doing stuff that's just so incredibly amazing and for me as a player, I was so influenced by them and just absorbed everything they did, you know, and Vi's whole history with Zappa and everything he did after right. that, and Alcatraz and all that. And then David Joe's Roth, whole, yeah. yeah, David Lee Roth. I mean, it's just like just wild, unbelievable stuff. Um, and of, of course, as a solo artist. And then Joe, you know, I remember teaching in a store on Long Island and um, a student of my, I'm sorry, another teacher in the store was a student of Joe's. And he somehow had his like early recordings of surfing. Oh, cool. And uh, Joe like probably wouldn't like, he, yeah, Joe probably wouldn't like to hear this, but he was playing stuff for me. <laughs> he probably shouldn't have, this guy. And, uh, you know, and then, then it just blew up and he was like the, the biggest thing and ended up being one of the most influential guitar players of all time. Right. Um, both those guys. But for me, back in 2001, to get asked to do G3 and go on tour with Joe and Steve, after all that history of just me sort of like practicing guitar all the time, worshiping those guys. I mean, I went to Berkeley because Steve, I went there, you know, like right. these guys are huge in my life. And then here I am touring with them and I'm on stage and I'm trading solos with them. And I'm like, yes. how did that's I get I here? That's what I watched that little <laughs> where you guys are just doing the three things. You know, I'm like, how did I get here? Yeah. And <laughs> I've said this a million times before, but it, it's funny. Like the thoughts that were going through my head, as we were trading and it would come to me and I was like thinking to myself, they, you know, I'm, I was so influenced by them. They're going to know this lick I'm playing. You know, I ripped <laughs> them off from this. Side. I was like, so paranoid <laughs> that uh, all these licks that I had in my arsenal were learned from them. Is there um, any, is there ever a time on that tour when the three of you just get shit faced? Uh, well, no, no, <laughs> no, not on that no. tour. There's no, no I mean, like epic fucking cocaine and hookers night on G3. Not, <laughs> like... No, not at all. It's, it, in fact, it's the total opposite. If anything, they're very, very uh, sort of contained, politely run. I mean, G G G3 is Joe's organization and it's just run so beautifully. Um, I, all of them. I mean, I ended up doing, you know, not only that tour with him, but so yeah, many more runs yeah, yeah much more right yeah. yeah and it was me and joe and uh paul gilbert and me and joe and eric johnson and me and joe and steve lukather and steve morris and uh i'm gonna forget somebody but um we you know we had a lily john roth we did we just had so much fun. oh that must have been awesome yeah it was really yeah, cool a big, i love lily john roth yeah that solo yeah. record of his is fucking oh it's so great earthquake and, and oh my god yeah he's such a great guy and we and we 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 went everywhere too i mean we toured in the u.s europe uh japan south america australia and even so, in all those tours there's no nights where you guys just get trapped i'm telling you and, it's no it's, it's play you know paranoid or something. it's totally you know i i i uh 
Sorry, I can't fulfill any rock and roll fantasy I'm, stories. No, I'm just, but I'm just curious. <laughs> it's pretty. It's pretty nerdy. It's pretty yeah. damn nerdy. But it's run Are very. Are these guys sober? They don't drink or nothing? No, not. Yeah, they don't. They don't drink. Oh, as okay. Far as, as far oh, as gotcha. I've seen, yeah, there's no partying at all. It's like just completely. Everybody's just like super cool and zen and like nice. Yeah. Like right. there's no. It's just just there's no weirdness at all. It's just completely cool but yeah it's not it's not wild and crazy yeah it's definitely I, not wild and i crazy. went to uh i went to the g3 that came to what did it come to the fox it came to the fox theater in okay Oakland, and it was Oakland, zach yeah. zach ingve nuno uh steve Vai, and i don't think satriani was there oh it's tosin uh well tosin that's a different that's a different so that's steve Vai's organization that's his generation x oh right right that's right. different okay. yeah okay yeah gotcha. right exactly yeah that was a good but, vibe though it was I, i've never been to the other i don't know what the difference is but it seemed very cool very chill yeah well it was, the other fun thing is that we you know in certain cities joe would you know obviously had a lot of friends and guitar players and we'd have people come up and play and so we had such great guest artists come up you know billy gibbons came up one day oh, wow it's awesome. all these great players yeah so it was fun actually i, I don't want to get into a bummer thing but one of the people in joe's life his manager mick brigden who uh it was with him forever and set all this stuff up. It was the reason why it was so great. Recently passed away a few months ago. It was such oh, a man. big loss, you know, uh, such a good friend and just, just one of the great ones in the business. And he was responsible along with Joe for making those incredible tours. And they, they would just do everything right. You know, like there'd be some fun, like crew outing day and we'd go bowling or whatever. And they'd always have like cool dinners and just loved being on the road and finding restaurants and, you know, whatever finding the sites it just a really cool fun that sounds vibe yeah, yeah. Awesome. very yeah. cool that's, that's, but yeah no no ragers on those tours <laughs> have there ever been a rager dream theater era like you, you know it's your guys is your guys's reputation's pretty squeaky clean i'm just it's pre- it is clean it i hate to say it, it, it it's we're about as nerdy as you get man it, <laughs> you know it's, it's just that it, we, we were cracking up there was one uh, this wasn't even that long ago. Like somebody walked into like a dressing room or it was like a, one of those things in Europe where it's like a big production room and there's long right. tables and literally the whole band and like tour manager, everybody was on their laptops. Right. It was like <laughs> literally <laughs> walking into laptops like, phones. yeah, totally. It was walking into Starbucks, you know, and somebody made it like, wow, this is real rock and roll. you guys. <laughs> but yeah, no, nobody, uh, everybody's just like, everybody's fun and everybody's cool. But yeah. everybody's the serious musician type. Like everybody just wants to play as good as they could possibly play. Yeah, you know, you guys will and crack a few beers after a show. Or absolutely, like bourbon or yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. The bourbon will come out. Um, you know, drinks will come out. Wine comes out. Right. Our singer James doesn't drink at all. Okay. Uh, during the touring, he does when he's off tour, but he insists for his voice not to yeah. do that. But yeah, we enjoy. You know, afterwards on the bus, chilling out. The bourbon and wine comes out, but not, yeah, not on stage, not backstage, not. There's not really like a not, groupie. There's not really groupies for prog bands, huh? No, no, <laughs> not at all. There's like and, dude, dude groupies. Yeah, exactly. Our whole audience, like for the longest time, has been mostly, you know, musicians and, and right. guys. And, you know, all of us too, we, we all got married like pretty young and started having families pretty young all around the same time. Oh, okay. So it's like all of us are in, you know, like, you know, 30 year or so long marriages with, oh, wow. you know, yeah, with like two, three kids who are adults now, you know, so it's just, right. that just wasn't our world. It's not something, again, I know that's like the rock and roll, <laughs> you know, uh, sort of stereotype or, or whatever. But for us, we just were serious from the beginning and we were kind of all family men and yeah. we just never, we never had that vibe going. I mean, on. it's a lot less than people probably imagine and so yeah. less than mo- other bands have played up to the hill yeah i remember we did so many shows with motorhead and you know you'd come up in the motorhead dressing room and let me would just be reading a book you know right not, exactly it not, yeah <laughs> it wasn't fucking chicks and blow and you know like it was right just like he's there reading a book for hours for hours exactly <laughs> like, it's funny and then some bands it was like that you know and the stories are real and i mean you you talked about like touring with Pantera and the whole thing. And those guys yeah. were definitely partying heavy and hard, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, I remember playing a festival with them. Uh, might've been in Finland or something. Those guys were going so hard. I, like, 
it was unbelievable. You know, I, I was like, how are they doing this? You know, yeah. <laughs> like, how are they doing this? How are they standing on stage? It was like insane. Yeah. Um, so saying sometimes like that, yeah, some of the stories were true, but the squeaky clean dream theater reputation is, <laughs> is not a rumor. It's <laughs> we're about as clean nerdy as you get, but you know, in my book, that's a good thing. You yeah. know, like I said, we've all raised beautiful families and we have a lot to be thankful for. So, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is a, it is a life less ordinary that you chose and it's yeah. awesome to be able to, to do it and you know, you, you got to be grateful every step of the way because exactly, you know, you, you really do. Be, I know I used to dig ditches for my uncle Donnie and wow. <laughs> and yeah. I'm they, so glad they, I don't have to do that anymore. And how long have you, t- yeah, how many times have you heard that? Like you could be digging ditches. Like you literally were. <laughs> yeah. 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 And think about how many, you know, musicians there are in the world that want to make it, you know, and it, it's, it's difficult to make it in the arcs, you know, and, and any, any field. So, when you you have that and you're able to do it it's something to be really proud of and thankful for and protective of you know right. can't take it for granted that's for sure you could be digging ditches yeah mike mangini i just want to give him a shout out before we wrap up here i did a yeah. jam with him uh we did an arf benefit which is uh tony la Russa's, the baseball manager's uh gotcha animal rescue Okay. And uh, every year he has a fundraiser to do it. And I guess he flew Mike in and okay. I was there to do it. And uh, that, that was the first time I'd ever met him or jammed with him or even yeah. seen him play. And I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I know. Fucking insanity. He's a total freak. Yeah. yeah. It, it, we, we have so much fun. It, you know, we, when uh, going back in time about 10 years or so ago, when Mike Portnoy did leave the band and we hired Mike Mangini, um, we, we did these drummer auditions and, uh, we had guys come in. I don't know if you ever saw them. They're on YouTube, but it was set with Roadrunner, and we did a whole produced, almost like reality I think I saw show. Some of this, yeah, yeah, it was almost something. like a reality show, you know. And it's eventually leading up towards the drummer being Mike Mangini. But one of the things I'll never forget is, you know, these guys had all come in, learn a few Dream Theater songs, we'd play them, and then we'd improvise and do some stuff. And he came in, and we started playing you know, for the first time. Never, we didn't rehearse, we didn't jam. We start playing like our own stuff. And it just sounded like we could have done a show. It was insane being in a room with him. Like, how are you doing that? <laughs> you know? Um, and so we knew he was the right guy. And so did you, did you work on new ideas? But like, did you try anything new with him? Back, back in those auditions? Yeah. We, you know what we did? We had, we had a three part audition. So one of them was uh, playing three dream theater songs. Another one, I think we just sort of jammed to kind of see mm-hmm. if the, the, guy was like good at improvising or we had a vibe and right. the other thing was i had this sort of riff that i would throw out and like we wanted to see if there was a creative element you know what what would this drummer do with this riff what would it turn into what was our chemistry you know our ideas right. going back and forth or is it oh, falling flat good, yeah we did yeah. that with all the guys they all did great you know but uh obviously mike did better and <laughs> he's been the drummer you know since then but yeah he's just a monster in, in fact you know we started talking about the new dream theater album and the song the alien and that being the first song that we did when we got into the studio last october and he just like has this groove and it's like it's in 17 8 and it's like oh that's a normal time signature mike you know he just starts playing all this stuff and all these variations and then but it, what it does it's like it just starts getting your wheels turning and start putting riffs to it and building it and things start going from there so it's it's great when it can when a drummer has a creative ability as well that can come in with grooves and things and and spark ideas and so that song was very much sparked by that and here we are you know yeah anyway dude yes congratulations on getting nominated for a grammy thank you fucking i mean you find out that news today how incredible that's fucking awesome you know, very cool yeah you know, you know who you're up against who are you up against uh yeah i was looking Is at it like it. green day no <laughs> green Day's nominated in the band you know like the right, right exactly no fucking super gigantic pop band that wins yeah. every time. well you know what's funny about that the first uh nomination we had uh when i was talking about the roadrunner years there um foo fighters were on there Right. And you're and, like, come on. Yeah. What and the they, fuck? and yeah, and they like, won you know it. The Foo Fighters are going to win this. Right. Come exactly. On. Yeah. It was, I remember Dave Grohl, he had said something like, oh, they should have got this, you know, which I thought was nice. But, um, but this time, uh, I don't know if I'm going to remember all of them, but 
it's i think it's gojira and macedon and it's a cool it's oh a wow cool list yeah it's not it's more i remember last there were a couple of years where i was surprised at the the nominees like it didn't seem like it was you know what i mean it seemed mm-hmm. a little bit strange but this this seems like appropriate right. um so we'll see you know it's it's fun it's it's an honor to get nominated and you know it's cool like i said doing doing what we do in the way that we do it and getting recognized in in that world is something that i never would have expected and now it's you know for us it's been this is the third one so it's cool it's a good feeling all right well best of luck with that man thanks great it was really great talking with you man absolutely yeah great talking to you too ladies and gentlemen right there the mighty mighty john petrucci aka the truch (laughs) with rob flynn